Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. A few weeks ago, some friends of mine were talking about the 1938 novel Rebecca and how good it is. That's the conversation I over oversaw slash overheard on Twitter. Uh, somehow, even though this is totally my kind of book, and I remember my mom having a copy of it when I was in high school, I never actually read the thing. And even though I was really into Alfred Hitchcock growing up, I had also never seen his film adaptation uh, beyond clips of it that are in documentaries like The Celluloid Closet. And then I also missed the BBC miniseries from 1997 and the Netflix adaptation that just came out last year. Like, somehow, I just had this total void of all Rebecca knowledge <laughs> beyond the title of the book and the fact that it really seems like my kind of thing. So, I checked Rebecca out from the library. I read it. I agreed with my friends about it being very good. And I became immediately fascinated with its author, Daphne du Maurier. And I thought about maybe saving this episode for October, since Rebecca was not the only Alfred Hitchcock movie to start out with her work, and a lot of her books have a very, like, dark and suspenseful and foreboding tone. But I was too eager for this to wait until October. (laughs) Everybody's going to get it now. Uh, Also, several heads up on this episode. Uh, There is going to be some brief discussion of incest, Also, a relationship between a teacher and a student, and disordered eating. That's a trifecta we have not had before. No, I feel like this is more more warnings than we have needed to put on an episode in a while. Yeah. Uh, So Daphne du Maurier became famous thanks to her books and the adaptations they inspired, but she was born into a family that was already full of really prominent people. Her father, Sir Gerald du Maurier, was an actor and a theater manager. And he was famous enough that when he ran into trouble with unpaid back taxes in 1929, he was able to make some extra money by licensing his name to a brand of cigarettes. Her mother, Muriel Beaumont, Lady du Maurier, had been an actress before she got married. And from a young age, Daphne aspired to be like her grandfather, Georges du Maurier, who was an artist for the magazine Punch and author of the extremely successful serialized novel Trilby, which was adapted into a play and multiple films. The du Mauriers were also connected to various other famous and influential people, including Peter Pan author J.M. Barry. He and Daphne's father started working together in 1902, with Gerald becoming the first person to play Captain Hook and George Darling in Peter Pan in 1904. Daphne and her sisters, Angela and Jean, called Barry Uncle Jim, and their cousins were the Llewellyn Davies boys, who were a big part of the inspiration for Peter Pan. Daphne was the middle child of the three Dumarier daughters, born in London on May 13, 1907. In some ways, the girl's upbringing is a little reminiscent of the Bronte siblings, which previous hosts of the show covered back in 2012. All three were highly imaginative, concocting make-believe worlds and scenarios for themselves. This would also carry over into all three sisters' adult lives. Jean was an artist. Angela would also grow up to be a novelist, although her work was always overshadowed by her sister Daphne. The girls were mostly educated at home, cared for by nannies, and educated by governesses. The family had pet names for virtually everyone in their lives. Like, one of the biographies I read for this had an index of all the pet names at the end. They had an invented language that they shared among themselves that was almost like a code. Like, Wayne meant embarrassing. A shilling was a disappointment. And Cairo was code for sex. As they reached puberty, Daphne and her sisters called their periods Robert. (laughs) Make it it French. It'll be Robert. Uh, Being raised by governesses and educated at home was a fairly typical upbringing for wealthy British children in the early 20th century. But in some ways, the Dumarier's upbringing really was not typical. Gerald Dumarier seems to have wanted sons, and in some ways he treated his daughters like boys, like teaching them to play cricket and box. Gerald actually told Daphne that he wished she were a boy, and at one point wrote her a poem that included the line, 
If only she'd been a boy. Daphne cut her hair short and she wore masculine clothes, and she and her sister Jean both made male alter egos for themselves. Jean was David Dampier, and Daphne was Eric Avon, who was dashing and full of daring do and who excelled at sports. Gerald's relationship with his daughters struck a lot of people as unusual. And as the girls became teenagers, he started oversharing the details of his affairs with them. As Daphne and her sisters started dating men, their father seemed to become jealous of them. According to Helen Taylor, who edited the Daphne du Maurier Companion, in 1965, Daphne du Maurier told her that she and her father had, in her words, crossed the line. This is something Taylor reported after du Maurier's death, and it is not something that du Maurier herself seems to have put down in writing. But incest did become a running theme in her fiction and a subject that people who knew her said seemed to fascinate her almost to the point of obsession. In an interview she gave late in her life, she said, quote, I don't mean bed incest. I mean this thing of sons looking for their mothers, daughters looking for their fathers. Another recurring theme in her writing was female characters who wished that they were boys, whether it was their expressing that wish or describing themselves as being like boys or being described by other characters along the lines of she should have been a boy. And this is something that Du Maurier did write about a lot in the context of her own life. She described herself as feeling like a boy in a girl's body and locking this boy self away in a box as she grew up to pursue a marriage and a family. Her writing also suggests that she saw this as a kind of a duality, envisioning herself more as a boy when she found herself attracted to women, but more as a woman when she was attracted to a man. Du Maurier's first accounts of her attraction to women come from her time at an exclusive finishing school in Meudon, France, where her classmates included heiresses and princesses. She started in January of 1925, and she soon met headmistress Mademoiselle Ferdinand Yvon, who Daphne called Ferdy. She was 30, and Daphne was 18. In a letter to a friend, Daphne wrote, quote, I've quite fallen for that woman I told you about, Mademoiselle Yvon. She has a fatal attraction. She's absolutely kind of lured me on, and now I'm coiled in the net. This relationship progressed from passing notes to Daphne accompanying her headmistress on vacation to a spa during the summer, to Fernand supervising and nursing Daphne when she had to go to Paris in the winter to be treated for a respiratory illness. Daphne never used the word lesbian to describe these attractions, though. She described lesbianism as, quote, a feeble substitute for married life and something to get over in youth. And in one letter called it, quote, that unattractive word that begins with L, continuing that she'd tear out the guts of anyone who described her love that way. Instead, she referred to her, quote, Venetian tendencies and framed her attraction to women as the reemergence of the boyish soul that she'd tried to shut away. Mademoiselle Yvonne was fired without explanation, or at least without explanation that she ever shared with Daphne in April of 1926. And Du Maurier worried that this was because of suspicions of, over their relationship. They continued to travel through France together after this, though, and they continued to write to one another after Daphne went back to England. When the Du Maurier's started talking about buying a home on the Cornwall coast, Daphne wondered if it was an attempt to sort of tempt her away from going back to France to be with Fernand. The Du Maurier's new home was called Fairyside, and when she turned 20, Daphne was allowed to stay there alone, and soon Cornwall became her adopted home. Many of her works are set in Cornwall with descriptions that are so evocative that Cornwall has been described as a character on its own. While in Cornwall, Du Maurier found an unoccupied home called Menabilly. It was originally built during the Tudor era, and it had been extensively remodeled in the 17th century. It was part of an estate owned by the Rashley family, but it was unoccupied, covered in ivy, and falling into disrepair. Du Maurier fell absolutely in love with this home and visited it over and over. It would eventually inspire the settings of multiple books, including Manderley and her novel Rebecca. 
1929, a rift developed in Daphne's relationship with Fernand. She wrote Fernand a letter in which she described her experiences kissing young men. And Fernand's response was angry and jealous. Soon after, Dumarier started a relationship with Carol Reed. He would go on to direct the 1949 film The Third Man. Although she continued to write to and visit Fernand after this, their relationship cooled. Dumarier published her first short story called And Now to God the Father on May 15, 1929. The story appeared in The Bystander, which her uncle edited. He published another of her short stories about a month later. Her first novel was The Loving Spirit, written at the summer home in Cornwall and published in 1931. Dumarier loved to walk through the countryside, and on one of these walks, she had found the wreck of a schooner called the Jane Slade. She became fascinated with the Slade family, researching their family history and reading through their letters and records. In The Loving Spirit, the Slades become the Coombs in a historical saga that winds through four generations of the family. Overall, this was a pretty conventional book. It was not like the more avant-garde and modernist writing that people like Gertrude Stein were writing that was coming out at around the same time. It was moderately successful. It was generally pretty well-reviewed. But it also set the stage for the idea that Dumarier was writing for a popular audience, not writing serious literature. It was only after her death that scholars really started to approach her work as being worthy of academic study. To be clear, it was important to her that she make money, but she described herself as writing what she was drawn to, rather than focusing on whether an idea could be a commercial success. While her publisher heavily promoted her work, throughout her career, she was also reluctant to promote her books herself through things like signings, appearances, and interviews. And in some ways, this actually just made her seem more intriguing to the public. Not long after The Loving Spirit was published, one of Dumarier's sisters told her that there was a very attractive man in a white motorboat who was going up and down the harbor outside of their house. Later on, they would describe him as a menace, which was their secret language word for the sort of incredibly attractive man that you might just lose your head over. This was Frederick Arthur Montague Browning, known as Boy, or as Tommy to the people who were closest to him. He had read The Loving Spirit and had become determined to meet its author, so he just took his boat over to the harbor outside their house. A little a little light stalking. Um... Dumarie's relationship with Browning really started when he visited her as she was recovering from an appendectomy in April of 1932, and they married on July 19th of 1932. They went on to have three children, Tessa, Flavia, and Christian, who was known as Kitts. And we'll talk more about all of this after we pause for a sponsor break. Daphne du Maurier's father, Gerald, died on April 11th, 1934. And not long after that, du Maurier wrote a biography of him called Gerald, a Portrait. Its publisher was Victor Goulantz, who also published previous podcast subject Isadora Duncan. This started a decades-long partnership between writer and publisher. Du Maurier's next novel was Jamaica Inn in 1936. It was set in Cornwall, this time inspired by Du Maurier's stay at the real inn of the same name. That inn was built in 1750 and had a long association with smuggling. Jamaica Inn was Du Maurier's first commercially successful novel, and Alfred Hitchcock adapted it into a film in 1939. Neither Du Maurier nor Hitchcock liked this adaptation, though. Actor Charles Lawton had bought the film rights with the intent of casting himself as the lead. He had selected Hitchcock to direct, but he didn't give the director much creative freedom. To return to 1936, Boy Browning was an officer in the Grenadier Guards, eventually attaining the rank of lieutenant general. When his regiment was sent to Alexandria, Egypt, Du Maurier went with him. She went back to England for a time when she learned she was pregnant with their second child. After their daughter was born, she left the children with their grandmothers and a nanny and then went back to Alexandria. She missed Cornwall desperately and found that she didn't enjoy all the overwhelming social obligations involved with being an officer's wife. She would say of herself, quote, I can't say I really like people. Perhaps that's why I always preferred to create my own. 
She also said she wrote, quote, because I never liked myself, and as a writer, I could lose myself in my characters. While she was pretty confident as a writer, she had some insecurities in terms of her personal life. Browning was 11 years older than she was, and before they had married, he had been engaged to Jeanette Luisa Ricardo, who was known as Jan. To Daphne, Jan just seemed far more alluring and glamorous than she was. She wondered why Jan and Boy had never gotten married. She wondered whether she could ever measure up to Jan. At one point, she found a stack of Jan's old letters to Boy tied up with a ribbon, and she read through all of them, noticing that she signed Jan with a very large and distinctive J. Dumarier's homesickness for Cornwall, her self-doubt, her envy and fascination with her husband's former fiancé, and the derelict estate of Menabilly all fed into her work on Rebecca. It was a book that she struggled to write, for a long time knowing only that it was about a widower's second wife who felt overshadowed by the late first wife, Rebecca. Victor Gallant's marketed Rebecca as a romance, and a lot of people read it that way. And that really surprised Daphne du Maurier. She described this book as a study in jealousy. Holly, have you read this book? Uh, I have, though it has been a long time, but I have seen the movie much more recently. I think maybe we'll talk about it some more in behind the scenes. Um, This drew out a lot of comparisons to Jane Eyre, with people describing du Maurier as sort of the spiritual successor to Charlotte Bronte. Rebecca was an immediate success when it was published in 1938. It sold 40,000 copies over the course of a month and was translated into multiple languages. In 1940, Du Maurier wrote Come Wind, Come Weather. And this was a brief collection of stories about ordinary people, meant to inspire the people of Britain during the hardships of World War II. Also in 1940, Alfred Hitchcock adapted Rebecca into the famous film, Du Maurier was much happier with this adaptation than she had been with Jamaica Inn, although that really was not a particularly high bar. This film was a huge success, both commercially and critically. It won Academy Awards for Best Picture and Best Cinematography, and it was the only one of Hitchcock's films to be named Best Picture. But it also caught the attention of other people whose work had some similarities to Du Maurier's. In 1941, Brazilian writer Carolina Nabucco publicly accused Du Maurier of plagiarizing Rebecca from her novel, A Sussexora. Nabucco had translated her book into English herself, and the English language manuscript had been passed around among publishers in the U.S. and England. Although Du Maurier's publisher managed to head off a legal battle, the New York Times published a piece tracing the many parallels between these two novels, Although that that piece does acknowledge that Rebecca's biggest surprises do not appear in A Sexora at all. Du Maurier denied any wrongdoing, noting that the stories about hasty marriages of young women to wealthy older men and widower second wives feeling intimidated by the woman who preceded them were really not at all unique. Yeah, she was kind of like, everybody, like, there are a ton of books. This is a trope! (laughs) (laughs) She acknowledged that fact. So by this point, Daphne and Boy had three children. Their son Kitts had been born also in 1940. Daphne doted on him far more than she had with either of their daughters. In 1943, she convinced Dr. John Rashley to lease Menabilly to her. The home was entailed to the Rashley family, so Du Maurier could never actually own it, but she was granted a 20-year lease under the condition that she maintain it. She called it My Mena. Mena Billy was in serious disrepair. It took several months of work before her family could move in, and although a lot of improvements were made, it was still really run down. There was no central heat, and it was infested with rodents and fungus and plants. Parts of it were completely off limits because of the risk of collapse. But Du Maurier adored it, and she lived there with a staff of cooks, servants, and nannies who cared for the children who knew not to disturb their mother when they heard the sound of the old typewriter she used to write her books. She was highly focused on her work. Her husband joked that when she was in the midst of working on a novel, she could walk into a lamppost and not even notice it. But she also made sure to make time to play with the children every day, and she loved to walk with the dogs and sail and arrange flowers to adorn their home. Du Maurier and her husband were apart during most of World War II because of his military service. 
including becoming chief of staff to Louis Mountbatten, the first Earl of Mountbatten, and also working with Prince Philip, later the Duke of Edinburgh. In 1946, he was knighted, and that made Du Maurier Lady Daphne Browning, although she was generally known as Daphne Du Maurier. You don't really see her called Daphne Browning unless it's in, like, a formal legal document or something. When Browning was appointed military secretary of the War Office in London in 1946, he was able to reunite with his wife after many years away at war. They had some trouble rekindling their relationship, though. Browning had also served in World War I and had recurring nightmares after returning home. His experiences in World War II had compounded that trauma. This episode isn't about him, so we're not going to go into a whole lot of detail, but he had been part of Operation Market Garden. During the planning stages, he was the one who described part of the operation as possibly being a bridge too far. The operation ultimately failed, leading to more than 15,000 Allied casualties and the loss of hundreds of aircraft. Browning spent the summer of 1946 with Dumarier at Menabili. Their relationship had previously been quite passionate, with the two of them describing themselves as deeply in love with each other. But in letters to Fernand that she wrote toward the end of that summer, Dumarier confided that it had become pretty much entirely platonic. Things got even harder when Browning went back to work, and they only saw each other on periodic weekends, with one of them visiting the other either at Menabili or in London. In 1947, Dumarier faced another plagiarism allegation, this time of Edwina MacDonald's 1927 novel, Blind Windows. That case had seemed like it was settled years before, but MacDonald had died and her son had resurrected the lawsuit. And this time, the case went to court, and Dumarier had to travel to New York City to testify. At this point, Dumarier was famous enough that her American publisher, Nelson Doubleday Sr., sent his wife Ellen to accompany Dumarier and her children on the transatlantic voyage. And Daphne fell absolutely in love with Ellen. At first, she really doesn't seem to have been sure how to deal with this. She was married, and in her mind, her Venetian tendencies and her boyish soul, that had all been sealed away. She tried to avoid Ellen aboard the ship, and gave her curt, kind of cold responses whenever Ellen would try to talk to her. Eventually, the two women did become close friends. Daphne confessed her feelings to Ellen, along with her sense that they were a reemergence of the boy that she had shut away. Ellen explained that she could not reciprocate this. Apart from not sharing the same feelings, her husband was dying of cancer. Ultimately, there was just no proof that Dumarier had ever read Blind Windows or the short story by the same author that it had been based on. And a judge ruled that while there were some parallels between the two, they were two different books, just with similar settings. That case was appealed, but it was ultimately dismissed. Dumarier returned to England and had what was described as a breakdown from the stress of the accusations and the court proceedings, the difficulties of the transatlantic voyage, and her unrequited feelings for Ellen Doubleday. In 1948, Frederick Browning became comptroller and treasurer to Princess Elizabeth, the future Queen Elizabeth II, and Prince Philip. That same year, Dumarier wrote the play September Tide, which became kind of a vehicle for her feelings for Ellen Doubleday. This story involves a widow named Stella who develops feelings for her son-in-law, Ewan. Stella was something of a stand-in for Ellen. When this play was staged in London in 1948, 50-year-old Gertrude Lawrence, who had previously had an affair with Dumarier's father, was cast in the role of Stella. At first, Dumarier really hated this casting. But over time, she described her feelings for Ellen transferring to Gertrude. Gertrude's part in this relationship isn't entirely clear. But Daphne was absolutely devastated when she suddenly died of cancer and hepatitis on September 6, 1952, at the age of 54. The lights on Broadway were dimmed to mark her passing. Uh, she's been noted as the first person to be honored this way on Broadway. This marked a shift in Dumarier's life, which we are going to get into after we first pause for a sponsor break. After the death of Gertrude Lawrence, Daphne du Maurier experienced a really deep depression, with her family describing her as almost catatonic. In 
And in addition to her grief, she just felt like she was getting old. Her book, My Cousin Rachel, which had come out in 1951, had been as enormously successful as Rebecca was. But then The Apple Tree, which was her short story collection that followed it, had been very badly reviewed. The Apple Tree was the collection that included her story, The Birds, and critics just found it to be too violent and sordid. After all this, Demare was having a lot more trouble writing and was feeling less creative. And her relationship with her husband, who was still working at Buckingham Palace and making periodic weekend visits, was becoming even more strained. In 1957, right around their 25th wedding anniversary, he was hospitalized for nervous exhaustion, compounded by the effects of alcohol abuse. Dumarie learned that he had been having affairs when one of the women that he was involved with called her to tell her it was all her fault. Although Dumarie is best known for her novels, she also wrote biographies. And one of these, which was The Infernal World of Branwell Bronte, came out in 1960. In 1963, Alfred Hitchcock finished his third Dumarie film adaptation. That was The Birds. Dumarie was not really a fan of this film. Hitchcock uh, moved the setting of the book from England to California. And while Dumarie's story focused on a farmer and his family, she described Hitchcock's characters as, quote, irritating people in San Francisco. She was frustrated by the changes that were made to the plot and the fact that he didn't often credit her work in interviews that he gave about the movie. This film led to another allegation of plagiarism, this time involving Frank Baker's 1936 novel, The Birds. Dumarie denied this as well, and it's again not clear whether she had ever read his novel. She said that her initial inspiration for The Birds started with watching flocks of birds following farmers as they plowed fields in Cornwall and wondering, what if they get tired of worms? On March 14th, 1965, Frederick Boy Browning died after a long period of declining physical and mental health, including the amputation of his lower left leg in 1964 because of circulatory problems. Dumarie was really grief-stricken and remorseful. She blamed herself. She felt like she had contributed to his death by staying in Cornwall while he was in London. For a year, she dressed only in black and white and took comfort in the idea that he was waiting for her. Although her books don't really include a lot of straight-up ghosts, they do sometimes have some otherworldly happenings. And after her husband's death, she had a growing interest in the paranormal. Four years later, Daphne du Maurier lost her lease on her beloved Menabilly. Dr. Rashley had died, and she'd spent several years negotiating with his heir who wanted to move in. So she leased another home on the Rashley property, known as Kilmarth, this time working out a lifetime lease, and she lived there for the rest of her life. While Kilmarth had a lovely view of the ocean, she missed Menabilly deeply. And this move also prompted another layer of grief over her husband's death. Browning had really loved Kilmarth, and he had encouraged Dumarie to move there before his death. When she learned that the foundations at Kilmarth dated back to the 14th century, she turned that idea into a book called The House in the Strand. After moving to Kilmarth, she also got a driver's license after going without one for 25 years so she could be more independent and visit her children and grandchildren more easily. Dumarie's last novel, Rule Britannia, was published in 1972. It's been described as almost predicting Brexit. It's set in the not-too-distant future, and it describes the UK leaving the European economic community and joining the US to form a new country, US-UK, pronounced you suck. (laughs) It was not subtle in its satire or its politics, and it was very badly received. After that, she published a couple of works of nonfiction, including an autobiography called Growing Pains, which came out in 1977. That book stopped with her marriage because she found she just could not continue after that point. She was also deeply upset by the portrayal of her late husband in the 1977 film A Bridge Too Far, which depicted him not only as being almost solely responsible for the failure of Operation Market Garden, but also insensitive to the loss of so many men. Feeling like she was at a total creative loss, Dumarie had an emotional breakdown in 1981. She died on April 19, 1989, at the age of 81, after a long period of decline, compounded by secretly refusing to eat. She was cremated, and her ashes were scattered at Kilmarth. 
During her lifetime, she had earned multiple honors and awards. These included the National Book Award for Rebecca in 1938 and being named a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature in 1952. She was named Dame Commander Order of the British Empire for her services to literature in 1969, and she earned the Mystery Writers of America Grand Master Award in 1977. It's clear that Daphne du Maurier experienced a lot of inner turmoil about her sexuality, her gender, and the expectations placed on her as a woman and as an officer's wife. But others described her as outwardly extremely calm and courteous, just about unflappable. Sheila Hodges, who was her editor for almost 40 years, described her as not wanting to be a bother during editing and accepting changes without complaint, writing, quote, no one could have been more cooperative or less prima donna-like than she was on those occasions. There was really only one book that Hodges described Du Maurier as really pushing back on, which was The Golden Lads, Sir Francis Bacon, Anthony Bacon, and Their Friends. Basically, Du Maurier had become really fascinated by the idea of a potential connection between Francis Bacon and William Shakespeare. And since she didn't have hard evidence, she had included this idea as like little illusions scattered throughout the book. Hodges cut all these out, and Du Maurier wrote to say that she wanted them all back in. She noted that most people probably were not even going to notice them, and, quote, if it annoys others, I just don't care. I love that. Uh, Hodges only learned much later that there were times when Du Maurier did not like her edits, but also didn't say anything about it. While Du Maurier is best known for her fiction, The Golden Lads was one of five biographies she wrote during her lifetime. She also wrote books on Cornwall, a history of the Du Maurier family, short stories, and plays. In addition to the three Alfred Hitchcock adaptations that we've discussed, there have been at least 10 film adaptations of her work and at least 40 TV dramatizations. Her work was usually well-suited to these kinds of adaptations. Some were slow-building and psychologically tense, which made for good dramas and thrillers, or they were more melodramatic and featured things like smugglers and pirates, or they were more romantic. She was also a really visual writer, which made it easy for filmmakers to see characters and settings in their mind's eye. One of the hallmarks of Du Maurier's books is striking first lines, so we thought we would end with a few of them. The most famous, of course, is the first line of Rebecca. Last night, I dreamt I went to Manderley again. The Birds begins with, On December the 3rd, the wind changed overnight, and it was winter. And then in the apple tree, it opens with, They told me afterwards they had found nothing, no trace of anyone, living or dead. She's also really good at uh, chapter endings. Yeah. <laughs> so you get to the end of the chapter and you're like, well, I can't stop there. But, right? You know, those, are, <laughs> those are harder to read as one sentence in a podcast. <laughs> um, I'm so glad that you did this one because I, I love her story. Um, it's complex and it's difficult, but it's also one of those things that's really illustrative of just the ways that people kind of create an image of someone who's in the public eye when really there is a whole other life going on, Mm -hmm. particularly their internal life and what they're struggling with um, or just trying to figure out. And I, I always like those stories. So thank you. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm glad I just saw two friends having a random conversation on Twitter about Rebecca. Took me down a whole a whole journey. <laughs> See, now I want you to do the dramatic reading of the Twitter, but really I know you have listener mail. <laughs> <laughs> I do have listener mail. It is from Amber. Amber says, uh, oh, this is in uh, in reference to our episode about the Nelson Pill hearings. And Amber said, hello, Holly and Tracy. I'm a few weeks behind on podcasts and have been catching up while unpacking from my recent move. Today, I listened to your podcast from the beginning of May on the Nelson Pill hearings which has come at an unusually meaningful time. A couple of years ago, I became aware of birth control side effects after a nurse practitioner, shout out to hardworking and well-educated nurses, notified me that the birth control I had been prescribed for the last decade may put me at a higher risk of stroke since I suffer from migraines with aura, 
Fast forward two years, and my cousin, who also suffers from very severe and frequent migraines with aura, began IVF. She was also completely unaware of the possibility that this may increase her stroke risk due to her additional risk factors. Her fertility doctor did not require her to get an exam from her neurologist, and this weekend, my cousin suffered a stroke. Luckily, due to the conversation she and I had as she was nearing the end of her IVF cycle, she went to the hospital in time and the stroke did not cause any major damage. My cousin is 33. I'm sharing this experience with the hope that people will advocate for themselves with their doctor. Ask them if you should get additional consults from your other specialists. If your doctor doesn't walk through risk factors of medications, ask them to do so. You're not a burden and your health is so much more meaningful than the five extra minutes that you need to give up. Holly and Tracy, thank you for continuing to break down meaningful historical topics that can also affect our daily lives. All the best, Amber. Thank you so much uh, for this email, Amber. I wrote back to Amber. I'm so glad that your cousin is okay, and I'm so glad that you gave us permission to read this. Um, I always want to check with people when I feel like they've shared something particularly personal, so thank you for allowing us to share this email and the you know, the, the warnings and uh, encouragement to talk to, to, to your doctors about concerns because um, I feel like that's just so incredibly important. So thank you again, Amber. If you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com and we're all over social media at Miss in History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app and Apple Podcast and anywhere else you get your favorite podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.